So good afternoon, everyone. So last week we started our reading again at the beginning of the book. And I think we came as far as page two, um, line 41. I think we read the first 41 lines. Yes, it, this, this canto is called the symbol dawn. So it tells about a dawn, the coming of the, the new light of a new day. But it's more than just that rising of the sun. This coming of the new day is representing something more than that. And because um, he's introducing this book which is full of psychological symbolism, perhaps the first uh, six pages, they are more packed with this psychological symbolism than any other part. So many layers of meaning <coughs> compressed together. It's also the part of the poem which Robindo has revised more times than any of the rest. Uh, I think more than 50 times he has gone through and made it more compressed, more intense, more densely significant. Yes. You can ask me a question, yes. The line F will abandon in the olive wood. Yes. Is the like a symbolism of an earth without grace? What was the project of the divine in that moment? No grace for the heart? Yes, I think what Shobindo has explained about this passage is that it represents a state of mind. This time, the darkest hour before the dawn. Of course, we know that the dawn is coming and we shouldn't feel depressed because of that darkness. But sometimes people, human beings, get into a state when they can only see and feel darkness. And perhaps we can call this state the mind of night. And so he's building up this picture of a universe that is full of this darkness. The darkness knows, it is conscious, it knows that light is coming, but it's afraid of that coming of the light. It wants to prevent it. It wants to go back to sleep, back to unconsciousness. It doesn't want to be forced to wake up. And so he's describing this on a universal scale starting out in space somewhere, in the unlit temple of eternity. There's not even a star, nothing. It's completely dark. <coughs> and this consciousness that wants to go back into an even greater darkness, a total darkness of unconsciousness. And in that darkness, it's as if the earth, then he zooms in from the universal scale to the planetary scale. And there the earth is dancing around and around, whirling around in complete darkness. And it's as if um, the gods are asleep. They are not there to pour their grace and their light. And into that total darkness, 
what comes is a tiny movement. And I mentioned that uh, I believe that this is something that happens before the sun rises. There may come a little breeze so that people who are familiar with the weather, um, they know, oh, this little breeze has come so soon the sunrise will come. Dawn. Yeah, but I remember mostly of these 40 lines. Yes. Is, and I wasn't aware of that. Mm. It was new for me. Uh, I talked about it uh, after last week. Mm. Uh, that what was so new for me that is that the darkness is not one darkness. There's a difference, and I recognize that in myself, but I, in, in some way. There's a difference between four o'clock at night and five after four uh, at night. <laughs> and, yes. that's what I, and I, I recognize that, but I don't know what that is. It's not one darkness. There's a lot of darknesses. Mm -hmm. That's what I different. remember most. Yes, yes. And that's because there are so many levels of darkness in us. And that's when, now, today, perhaps we shall read the first beginning of the coming of the light. Um, if we can concentrate inside ourselves and feel the darknesses and sense the light coming into them, um, it can happen on many different levels, depending on what state we are in. So the, but the significant thing that we finished with yesterday, uh, last week was this little movement. Hmm? Something in that inscrutable darkness stirred. There's a movement, a nameless movement. And on another level, that movement corresponds to an idea. An idea that doesn't get formulated in thought or in word, no? but there's something insistent about it. There's something that is dissatisfied, and yet it doesn't have an aim. It doesn't know what it is that it wants. It doesn't know what is the meaning of its own little movement. But there's something something that wishes to be, to exist, but it doesn't know how to do that. Mother says nothing is organized. There's no way for it to be. There's no life, there's no thought. How can it be? But that wish or that tiny movement of wishing to be, this wakes up something else. It teased. This word is like uh, tickling somebody with a piece of grass. You know, they're sleeping, your friend is sleeping, you want to wake him up. Tickle, teasing. Teasing the inconscience that utter darkness of unconsciousness. It has to wake up a little bit because there's this insistent something which is uh, forcing it to wake up. Hmm? And what wakes up is ignorance. Ignorance means knowing that there's something you don't know. Hmm? You've the feeling of incompleteness. So there's this little movement, a kind of throw. A throw is an involuntary, convulsive movement. It just comes for a moment, like that little breeze before the sunrise, and then it's gone. But it's as if where that movement has been, there's still a little movement. A quivering trace, just a, a remainder or a track or a reminder of something. And that 
quivering trace leaves some room in the darkness. It leaves some space and in that space it's as if something wakes up an old, tired want, unfilled. There's a wish, an unfulfilled wish that unfulfilled wish has been perfectly asleep, at peace, in its subconscious, moonless cave. A dark cave where there's not even a ray of moonlight that is subconscious, it's not in the conscious mind at all. But that want, that unfulfilled wish, has suddenly room to lift up its head and look around. It's looking for some light that isn't there. Everything is still dark. No? But it's as if it knows there should be light. It's looking for absent light. No? Its eyes are still closed. I don't know how it is with you, but increasingly now as I get older, I wake up, but my eyes don't open. Sometimes it takes quite, quite a while for the eyes to open. So these are closed eyes, but something there is trying to see, straining closed eyes of vanished memory. It wants to see something from the past, but there's no memory there. It can't remember what is that thing that it wants. So Sri says that's like somebody who is remembering vaguely something that he's been in the past and he wants to find that back. One who searches for a bygone self. As if for some reason, for some, on some small impulse, whatever it is, we try to remember a past life or something in this life that we've forgotten. We know, oh, there was something. What was it? Searching for something that he's been in the past, but he doesn't find it. He only finds the corpse, the dead body of whatever it is that he's searching for. He doesn't find the thing itself. So this is very obviously not describing a purely physical phenomenon. It's describing a psychological state. And then he, um, Shrobindo continues this as if or as though. It was as though even in this noughts profound, even in this ultimate dissolution's core, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to resume the effort and the pang, reviving in another frustrate world. An unshaped consciousness, desired light, and a blank prescience yearned towards distant change. 
as if a childlike finger laid on a cheek, reminded of the endless need in things, the heedless mother of the universe. An infant longing clutched the somber vast. Insensibly, somewhere, a breach began. A long, long line of hesitating hue, like a vague smile tempting a desert heart, troubled the far rim of life's obscure sleep. Arrived from the other side of boundlessness, an eye of deity peered through the dumb deeps. A scout in a reconnaissance from the sun, it seemed amid a heavy cosmic rest, the torpor of a sick and weary world to seek for a spirit sold and desolate, too fallen to recollect forgotten bliss. Intervening in a mindless universe, its message crept through the reluctant hush calling the adventure of consciousness and joy and conquering nature's disillusioned breast compelled renewed consent to see and feel. A thought was sown in the unsounded void. A sense was born within the darkness depths. A memory quivered in the heart of time as if a soul long dead were moved to live. But the oblivion that succeeds the fall had blotted the crowded tablets of the past. And all that was destroyed must be rebuilt and old experience labored out once more. It seems to be about a soul waking up. At least that's how it seems to be about <laughs> today as we read it, as I read it. Deva. Can you read it just one line more? No, I want to read that next time. <laughs> it's a wonderful line, but let's, let's absorb all this first before we come to that line. <laughs> yes, Bethel. It was as sold even in its notes profound, even in its ultimate dissolution form, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to assume the effort and the pain. Dividing in another frustrated world. Yes. So it was as though even in this, the depths, this deepness, profound is usually an adjective. Shobindo is using it as a noun. In the profoundness, the deeps of this nothingness, this naught, 
this zero, this fathomless zero. Even in that, even in the core, the core is the very center you know, of an apple or the core of the earth, as if in the very, very center of that, what seems like an ultimate last dissolution when everything is dissolved. You know? So there's really nothing anymore. As if right in the very core of all that nothingness, of that collapse, you know, something is still hiding, lurking, hiding there. An entity, something, some kind of individuality or being. You know? But it doesn't remember anything. It's just there. No? This is, seems to be the only survivor. Everything has been dissolved. Only this entity is there. It's a survivor from a past which is completely dead and buried, slain, killed. A past, there's nothing left of that past anymore. Only this little entity has survived. And because it's survived, it is condemned, it is forced, even though it doesn't want to, it has to again take up the effort, the struggle and the pain of living. It has to wake up, it has to revive, it's been dead, it's been comfortably at sleep in its moonless cave. But now it has to wake up. And it doesn't want to wake up. It thinks, oh my God, another frustrate world all over again. Oh dear. It's like the feeling of waking up in the morning sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do I have to? <laughs> Janaka, would you read the next sentence, please? Okay. An unshaped consciousness desire life and the blank prescience we Change. Yes. So there's something that doesn't want to wake up, that feels condemned. But there's some other part which does want to wake up. There's this consciousness, it's a formless consciousness, unshaped consciousness. But that's the one that's lifting its head and looking for absent light. And there's something in that unshaped consciousness which knows that there must be light as a prescience, a foreknowing, knowing in advance. And it's saying yes, it's yearning towards that change even though it is so far away, yearned towards distant change. So there's two movements going on here. There's the movement, the approach of the divine event, the knowledge that light must come, and there's the other part that's saying, oh, do I have to? Can't I go back to sleep? Can't I cease to exist altogether? Can't I go back to that tenebrous womb that I was born from? Why can't I go back into that darkness? Hmm? Patricia. As if a childlike finger laid on a cheek, reminded of the endless need in things, the heedless mother of the universe, an infant longing clutched to the sovereign So this is a lovely image. Hmm? That somber vast, that
that universal darkness. Perhaps it's like that because the mother of the universe is asleep. She's not paying attention. No? But now there's this little movement of wanting light. No? And that's like the child laying its finger on the mother's cheek. And that wakes her up. She feels it. it. That little touch reminds her of the endless need in things, that unsatisfied longing. A childlike finger. And babies do that. No? They will lay their finger on the mother's cheek sleeping mother, she will feel it, even if it's only such a, a gentle touch, and she will respond somehow. So now comes the response. Up to this moment, it's all completely dark. If we were to make a film, I hope one day some great artist will make a film <coughs> or a series of films of Savitri. And if he were to make a film, up to this point is complete darkness. There's only been that little tiny stir. I don't know how he would show that. <coughs> but now, because of that little movement, something happens. Would you read? Sensibly, somewhere which began a long, long line of hesitating to like a great smile, tempting a blessed heart, travel the far dream of life's obscurity. Yes, thank you. Insensibly, it means we can't tell when that happens. Somewhere, we can't tell where it happens. But there's, who knows what a breach is? Who can say something about a breach? An opening. An opening. Yeah, something opens up. I like, like a crack. Yes. Hmm? So it just begins, and we can't tell exactly where that. I, perhaps you might have. Uh, I remember many years ago standing on a mountain top somewhere near Darjeeling. And we'd been told to watch for the sunrise. No? Um, so you wait and you wait and you wait, and there are clouds, and <laughs> actually the sunrise never comes. But it might come. <laughs> it might come. The, this long, long line of hesitating hue. It's a very, very pale light. Hmm? And he says that that light, that line of light, it's like a smile. The universe is smiling. Hmm? And that smile is tempting, it's encouraging a heart that is absolutely a desert heart. There's no hope, there's no... Uh, it's completely abandoned and desolate, but somebody's smiling at it. Hmm? That vague smile. And then that desert heart actually doesn't know whether that's good or not. That's troubling. Hmm? That far rim, that edge of the horizon, that's the edge where life, everything is asleep, it's still completely dark. But there on the far rim, there's this long, long line of hesitating hue. Can't even say what <coughs> color it is. It's such a pale light. And that troubles the far rim, the distant edge of the obscure sleep of life. Everything is asleep. 
on the earth. John. Arrived from the other side of boundlessness, the eye of deity peers through the dark deeps. A scout in a reconnaissance from the sun, it seemed to knit a heavy cosmic rest, the torpor of a sick and weary world, to seek for a spirit soul and desolate, to form, to form, to recollect for what he was. So you remember the mother said, I quoted the mother's comment about this little movement, this something that stirred. She said, it's like the very beginning of aspiration. Hmm? That little unconscious movement doesn't know what it wants, but it wants something. So that's like the f finger of the universe reminding its heedless mother to wake up. And then there is a response. There's always a response to aspiration, to any small movement of aspiration. There will always be a response. So after that long, lone line of hesitating hue, suddenly the sun breaks through. There's an eye, or it's maybe not the sun, there's an eye-shaped uh, light, no? which seems it's come from the other side of eternity, infinity, the other side of boundlessness, an eye of deity, a divine eye, starts peering, looking. If you peer, it means you're making an effort to see. Hmm? Peered through these silent deeps of darkness. And this light has come from the sun. It's not the sun itself. It's going in advance. A scout is a person who goes ahead in front of the army to find out what the terrain is and whether there are any enemies there or villages. Going ahead you know, to suss things out. So this eye is like that. It's a scout in a reconnaissance. That's what a reconnaissance is, sending out some scouts to find out information about the way ahead. Hmm? So this eye that's looking, that's peering, it seems to be looking for someone. It's looking for where that little movement came from. Who was that? Everything is in a state of heavy cosmic rest. And he says it's a torpor. A torpor is when you're in a very heavy state of sleepiness because you've taken too much medicine or too much alcohol or something. The brain is not functioning. The body's not functioning. So the whole universe seems to be in this state of a, a sick and weary world. Mm. But that eye is looking for something. It's seeking for this single spirit, this soul spirit, who's abandoned there, lost there, the only survivor of this universal dissolution. <coughs> and obviously that spirit is too fallen. It's uh, fallen so far and it's in such a, an unconscious state that it can't even remember where it has fallen from. It has fallen from the divine Ananda. Mother speaks about the soul doing this, no? coming into the world and falling on its head, she says. It doesn't remember anything. So it's like that. The mother is looking for, 
that one who has fallen down and is in such a stunned state that it can't remember the bliss that it has come from. Lorraine, would you read? Intervening in a mindless universe, its message crept through the reluctant hush, calling the adventure of consciousness and joy, and conquering nature's disillusioned breath, compelled, renewed, Consent to see and feel. Hmm. Yes. So this is that scout, that eye of deity. It's intervening, it's coming in and doing something in this mindless universe, in this state of universal darkness. It's a message of light. No? It's a message creeps through this silence which seems to be resisting it. It doesn't want to take on this message. But still the message keeps on creeping through that reluctant silence. And what it's calling out and telling about, not in words or in sounds, but just in light, in consciousness, it's calling out or inviting to the adventure of consciousness and joy. Offering the possibility that things don't always have to be black, torpor, mindlessness. No? There's another possibility. And that uh, message is quite convincing. It manages to overcome the reluctance of nature. Nature's disillusioned breast. When you're disillusioned, you think, what's the use? What's the use of making any more effort? I've done it all, I've tried it all. It's not worthwhile. No? That's being disillusioned. So it's as if nature's like that. She's reluctant. She doesn't want to wake up. But that message forces her to wake up. It compels. She has to agree to see and feel. Even a small light coming into darkness can compel us to see. Of course, if we screw our eyes up. But even then, we know the light is there. Just a tiny light uh, obliges us to see. And especially psychologically, you know, if somebody uh, brings a light into your consciousness, you can't refuse to be aware of what it has lit up. Kamala. A thought was sown in the unsounded void. A sense was born. <coughs> Within the darkness depths, a memory quivered in the heart of time, as if a soul long that were moved to live, but the oblivion that succeeds the fall had rooted the grounder targets of the past, and all that was destroyed must be rebuilt. An old experience leveled out once more. Yes. So there's compelled consent. And because of that, thought comes back. Just a very, very small possibility of thought, like a seed, gets sown, planted, in this emptiness, 
this unsounded. Unsounded is the same as fathomless. Um, a fathom is the, I said last week, it's the measure that we use to measure how deep the sea is. And the method of measuring how deep the sea is, of course, nowadays they do it all electronically or with radar or something. But it used to be to tie something heavy, a piece of lead or a stone, onto a string or a rope and to lower that down into the sea. And on, along the rope at regular intervals there were knots tied. So when you felt the, the stone touch the bottom and that this rope becomes slack, then you can pull it up and see how many fathoms are there. And that was important in the days of uh, sailing ships. Uh, sailors, it was important to know where the bottom is. So unsounded, it means nobody has ever measured how deep this emptiness is. No? But a thought, the possibility of thought has been planted there. And within the darkness depths, the, deep, the profound of this darkness, a sense, the first beginning of perception. We can say the first beginning of life. A sense was born within the darkness depths. And a memory, this, this um, vanished memory, it wakes up quivers there in the very heart of time. So that's as if maybe something like that happens when a soul has fallen into a state of deep slumber between lives after death. And then something wakes it up. Later on in the poem, there's a, a beautiful passage where King Asvapati comes to the, the world of soul. And there he sees the beings that once wore forms on earth. They are sleeping there in internatal trance, in the, the sleep that comes between a death and a birth. And those dreams, those, uh, those souls, they are absorbing in their sleep, they're assimilating their past. That's what we do when we sleep. You know, we assimilate the things that have happened to us during the day and the things that have been wor worrying us. Somehow I, we digest all that. You know? And then something in us, the soul part in us, starts to prepare the waking up. So it's like that, as if a soul that's been long dead feels the impulse to wake up and live again. But then at the same time, there's this reluctance because of the oblivion, the forgetfulness. Oblivion is when you totally forget. Hmm? That is what happens after the fall, when we fall on our heads, entering the material universe. So that fall has blotted out, wiped out whatever was written. There were those tablets recording noting down everything that had happened in the past. But this forgetfulness has come and it's as if the tablets are wiped clean and nothing of that past can be remembered. There's only the feeling that, oh, it will all have to be done again. Hmm? Everything that was destroyed 
everything that's been wiped out, everything that's been dissolved, will have to be built up again. And those old experiences, we're going to have to go through all that effort again. It's too much. It feels like too much. How is it possible? How can it ever be done? This memory hmm. is quivering in the heart of time. Hmm. Not in <coughs> Entity. Not in an individual heart, no. It's just one little entity in the whole universe. Mm. We have the same question. Yes, Yankala. We have also the same question of the fish. Heart of time. The time is big days, universe. It's the universal time. Yeah. So in the very core of that time, because the whole universe has been in darkness. Yeah. It's been a state of universal darkness. Yeah. And in that darkness, something is beginning to wake up. Yeah. So now you can read that line, Janaka. The next line. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All can be done if the other touch is there. Yeah. So that's the reassurance that comes. It seems impossible. It seems too much. But everything is possible if the God touch is there, the touch of divine grace. Yeah. Shalom. Hmm. In 1958, yes. arrived from the other Up side of the boundlessness. boundlessness. Boundlessness, it means there's no boundary, there's no limit. Then the other side. Yes, how can there be an other side? But the earth is here, all around is boundlessness. From some far distance, something is coming. But yes, it's, it's one of these paradoxical expressions of Sri Aurobindo that are meant to expand our consciousness. Yeah. So those who wish, we can go back to line 42 and read this passage together. <coughs> Trying to get this lovely mantric rhythm. It was as though even in this not's profound, even in this ultimate dissolution's core, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to resume the effort and the pang, reviving in another frustrate world, an unshaped consciousness, desired light and a blank prescience yearned towards distant change. As if a childlike finger laid on a cheek, reminded of the endless need in things, the heedless mother of the universe, an infant longing clutched the somber vast. It 
Insensibly, somewhere, a breach began. A long, long line of hesitating hue, like a vague smile tempting a desert heart, troubled the far rim of life's obscure sleep. Arrived from the other side of boundlessness, an eye of deity peered through the dumb deeps. A scout in a reconnaissance from the sun, it seemed amid a heavy cosmic rest, the torpor of a sick and weary world to seek for a spirit soul and desolate too fallen to recollect forgotten bliss intervening in a mindless universe its message crept through the reluctant hush, calling the adventure of consciousness and joy, and conquering nature's disillusioned breast, compelled renewed consent to see and feel. A thought was sown in the unsounded void. A sense was born within the darkness depths. A memory quivered in the heart of time, as if a soul long dead were moved to live. But the oblivion that succeeds the fall had blotted the crowded tablets of the past, and all that was destroyed must be rebuilt and old experience labored out once more. All can be done if the God touch is there. 